A short disclaimer before I get into my first podcast of 2021, I uh, just want to let people know that um, my mental health hasn't really been that great, so I apologize if I don't really sound um, up to speed, or if I sound very mellow and I have a hard time uh, keeping a train of thought and I say um and things like that a lot, uh, things have just been really difficult for me inside my head lately. So I just, I've, I've had a lot of brain fog, um, so I hope that you can look past that whenever you listen and uh, realize that I'm just, I'm just not well right now. So regardless of that, I, I just knowing that, keeping that in mind, I hope that, that people can still enjoy, have some enjoyment out of this uh, podcast. I mean, there's a reason I haven't really been recording a whole lot of these lately, uh, so just Keep that in mind. I just want to let you know that before we get into it. So this is the new year, and I don't feel any different. The clanking of crystals, explosions off in the distance, in the distance. Ha 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 ha. Welcome, theatrics, to a brand new year. It is 2021. I know that it is already uh, almost through the entire first month of 2021. It certainly has been uh, quite a while since I've recorded a new podcast, but don't fret because I have several coming in the next few weeks, including this one right now. And basically what I'm going to be doing today is I'm going to be doing, it's not really a new thing because I've done similar things like it, but it's something that I hope to do more in the near future and, and of course during this year which is called Theatric Readings. And basically what it is, is very simple. All it is is that I'm going to be reading some some excerpts or some stories that people have written. Um, I have a friend of mine who has uh, sent me some <clears throat> some short stories that he wrote, and forgive me, I don't... <laughs> I already kind of forgot what his pen name is. Um, he is the person behind a publishing company and a blog called Boxhead Books. Let me, uh, I should have done some more preparation before this, but uh, I just simply haven't. I'm not very good at preparation. I'm sorry. Um, let's see, let's see. What is it? 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 Let me check. Let me check. Let me check. Check, 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 check. T.L. Oberhue. So he is a writer. He, they, whatever, whatever their preferred pronoun is. They are a writer, and I'm going to be reading, um five short stories that they wrote today. But before I get into that, I just want to talk a little bit about the new year and 2020, because wow, what a year that was. It was such a crazy year for everybody. I remember a year ago on uh, January 1st, 2020, the new decade, we're back in the 20s and nobody had any, any clue uh, what kind of year it was going to be. Um, I was I was just visiting a friend at the time. Uh, he had a birthday, so I went down to visit him for his 30th. And uh, I was basically, I spent uh, the end of the year, I guess, with his family. They had a little New Year's party. And then after the New Year's party, my friend drove me to Austin to get on a bus headed back home so that I could start a new job on January 2nd, 2020. And that was whenever, uh, so I was on a bus basically when it became 2020. And uh, the next day I started uh, waiting tables for the first time. And I wrote about that in my blog, if you want to check that out. But then, uh, and obviously as a dyspraxic, I struggled quite a bit at that job, which you can also read about. But um, after... 
after a couple of months, right as I was getting used to uh, working there, um, that's when the pandemic hit, when uh, COVID-19 kind of became an outbreak. And I remember my friend, the same friend that I went to visit uh, at the end of the previous year, 2019, I remember him uh, talking about how he was worried about this virus that people were talking about, and this was before anyone was really talking about it, at least in my circles. And then all of a sudden, people started freaking out. People started basically uh, <laughs> hoarding toilet paper and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it was just pandemonium. And uh, and then it kind of died down. And here in Texas, like people kind of got over it pretty quickly. Um, they kind of shut down all the restaurants, so I was out of a job for a few months. And um, that was whenever I met uh, my dyspraxic friends, my friends in the dyspraxic circle, and I've spoken about them a bit, um, mostly positive things. I know that, well, you know, I was, I was attending these Zoom meetings with people, and again, I apologize if I sound like I'm, I'm rambling, because I literally just kind of hit record and wanted to record this little introduction and talk a little bit about the new year before I get into these readings, which I'm looking forward to, but... Um, I, I met some, some really good people, some really supportive people. They were supportive to me, and I was supportive to them. Um, we even had our special meetings where I would read excerpts from my book, and people would give their thoughts and opinions. And I did some live streams with people. I did some, a, a couple, not a, very many, but some um, podcast interviews. And um, Unfortunately, towards the end of the year, uh, I kind of got into a little bit of hot water, which if you've heard any of my previous uh, podcast recordings, my episodes, uh, you'll kind of know what, what went down, and I know that I've lost some favor with some of my friends, and, and thankfully there are people who have kind of come around to supporting me again and kind of understanding my side of, of things and um, understanding that, you know, I was just expressing my opinions and whether, whether or not you think that I did the right thing, I know that I made some mistakes. Um, but I definitely think that other people's attitudes towards those mistakes, um, were worse than, than anything that I did. Uh, especially some of the people, and it's not just me either, because these same people, uh, have also harassed other members of the dyspraxic community, uh, and it's it's a shame because I want everyone to kind of work together. And and as dyspraxics, you know, we're we're very isolated from the rest of the world. So when we isolate ourselves from each other, then it's just not a it's not a good thing. And I'm all about bringing people together, no matter what people think about me. Uh, I don't ever want to feel. I I just feel. We should all be considered equal, and we should all have the freedoms to to have different opinions, and that should be okay, you know. And we should be able to talk about it. You know, I know that people feel like they have a right to block whoever they they want, and they do. But just because you have the right doesn't mean that it's the right thing to do. And I've said this uh, several times. Yes, you you don't necessarily need to give someone a reason but it's the fair thing to do it's the appropriate thing to do especially when somebody has always been supportive of of what you do and your cause and has always encouraged you uh it's and, and is a considered a friend and a colleague then it's only fair if you if you feel like you need to distance yourself from them for whatever reason it's fair to discuss it with that person and try to amend things before um, so I've talked about that a few times, and I, I don't know how much more I can get my point across. I know that people just don't, some people, not everybody, but some people just don't want to listen. And I, it was hard for me, because I lost some friends, and I know that, you know, I'm not really allowed to be in sort of like the major aspects of, of dyspraxia awareness, which it, it hurts, because I want to do everything that I can to help people and to encourage dyspraxics and and luckily I have I still have some dyspraxics who have agreed to come on here and and uh become guests on this podcast so I'm looking forward to that and uh all the different dyspraxics that I talk to in the future and all other people that I'm that I will talk to in the future about all sorts of different topics it's like I've said before uh, it doesn't matter what the topic is, if it's important to you and it's something that you feel like needs to be discussed and you want a platform, 
I'm here to give you that platform. So that being said, also, if you're a writer or if you have something, not even if you're a writer, but even if like, say you have a blog, even if it's things like dyspraxia, if you have like written an article and you would like me to read that article out loud, then I'd be happy to do that. Um, same with short stories. You know, I'm a bit of a writer myself. I'm writing a book. I've written short stories. I've written uh, song lyrics. Um, I, I work with a collaborator right now who's probably listening to this, Matt, uh, and he's going to be releasing some of our songs in the near future. And I'm very, I'm looking forward to that. And I'm very much looking forward to promoting that when that eventually kind of comes into, into play. And I, be, we actually have something that we can share to the rest of the world and I could encourage our music and his music. Um, so I have a lot of different things going on, and I haven't really been focusing on my podcast that, during this month that that much. I'm mainly focusing on my book. And one of the reasons, too, that I haven't really been recording much is just because, you know, as a dyspraxic, and I think partly because I'm pretty sure that I'm also ADHD, um, it can be really hard to just kind of talk sometimes and you, I get it kind of embarrassed because I get tongue tied a lot. Uh, I blank my mind a lot. Um, so I end up saying things that don't make sense. I don't feel like I sound very intelligent. Some people say that I sound intelligent. I never think that I do. Um, and it's just because I always lose my train of thought. I'm always distracted either by things around me or my own, my own thoughts and things like that. Um, that's why I like reading things because if I read things, then um, then I could just kind of stick to the page, and I'm always glued to whatever I'm reading. Um, but sometimes you just need it to speak from the heart, and if you rely too much on like a script or something, then it, then you run the risk of it sounding artificial. So here I am, just kind of talking and introducing the new year, and. Um, I have a lot of hope for this year. Uh, in fact, it, today is January 20th, and it's going to be the day that I uh, upload this as well. It's going to be my first podcast of 2021, the first of, I hope, to be many. And I have a lot of hope for this new year, and I have a lot of things that I want to do with my podcast, and um, I don't know if I'll finish my book this year, I'm hoping, but uh, I'm, I am taking my time on that because I want to make it sort of the best that I can make and I want to truly encapsulate the the story that I want to tell which is my my story as a dyspraxic and and just everything else I mean it's really hard to to tell people that you're writing a book about yourself when you're not famous because uh people are always gonna people are always like scratching their heads like why 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 would anyone be interested in in reading that book but I just feel like I feel like whenever people read it, they're going to understand why I wrote it and why I chose to, to tell that story. And I think people are going to be interested in it. I think people are going to be interested in it when they read it the same way that a person would be interested in a compelling work of fiction. That's what I think. That's kind of what I equate it to. It doesn't really matter that it's a true story. I mean, it, it does kind of matter because it makes it more real and it makes it uh, more of an impact that's why i like reading memoirs and autobiographies and stuff but um to me it, it's it's still interesting uh as if if as if it was a really enjoyable piece of, of fiction um and i i have several people who have talked about being guests on so gonna be doing that i'm sure a lot of things are gonna be uh be on here uh, a lot of I'm losing my train of thought already uh, I know that um, I'm hoping to have a lot of people on as guests and I'm hoping to be able to read things and I know a lot of crazy things are probably going to happen this year and I, I didn't even finish my point about you know why I mentioned the date it's January 20th which means that today is the uh, inauguration day for uh, our new president Joe Biden uh, now I was never a supporter of Trump, and I don't want to talk too much about my political affiliations. Um, I'm I'm a moderate, uh, so I don't really consider myself e part of either side of the political spectrum. I have my issues with both sides, um, and if people want to know more about that, they they're welcome to to hear more about it. But uh, so my 
the bar is pretty low at this point. You know, after after Donald Trump, there's really not much you can expect. Uh, you know, the <laughs> the stand the standards are not that high, but we have to kind of raise those standards because you know we have to hold Joe Biden accountable, and we have to uh, we can't just you know say that he's this white knight coming in to to save our country uh just because he's and that he's gonna be like our savior just because he's not trump you know anybody would be better than trump and i'm 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 i have hopes for his presidency mainly because i feel like he's going to be more competent he's going to be more competent than uh donald trump just based on the fact that he has you know way more experience he used to be vice president he worked as a senator for for many many years so um he's definitely qualified for the position um i just hope that he makes the right the right choices and that uh we we are progressive but we're not progressive in the wrong ways if that makes sense uh in the sense that i hope that we don't put in start putting in laws that restrict people's free speech and things like that but anyway I think that, uh, so today is a, uh, I think it's the start of a new era, and uh, I have a lot of faith and a lot of hope in the world c uh, coming up. I think things are going to start getting better soon, and hopefully in my life personally, hope, hopefully things, I mean obviously not just me, I don't want to sound selfish and egotistical, um, but as difficult as the past few years have been for me, I... I hope that some some good things come for me, and same with my colleagues, even people that consider me an enemy. Uh, I hope for some some good things for them as well. Um, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna stand in in my own way. I'm not going to I'm not going to remain living in bitterness uh, just because of of just ridiculous things that people do or say, you know. It just I'm I'm gonna try and look forward and try to be optimistic. So that's kind of what I wanted to say before I get into it. I know I rambled quite a bit, um, but today I'm going to be reading. And I'm sorry if I mispronounce this, but I'm going to be reading short stories from T. L. Oberhue, Oberho, or O. B. E. R. H. E. U. I probably should have asked for a pronunciation of that. But anyway, uh, without further ado. Let me read the first short story. The first story is called Box of Ramblings Number 2. As I drove to the cafe where I am currently writing this, my temper has started to fade, as did a number of unknown cigarettes that hung in my mouth. I didn't explode at anyone, but I began to wonder why I got so upset as to storm out of my living area. Then I began to think about the concepts of emotions and moods we collectively, as a species, go through, quite randomly sometimes. From the point of getting in my car to some amount of minutes later, I went back to why I got so angry, seemingly randomly, at my friend, who quite honestly didn't do anything to me. At the time of writing this, I switched my vice to my more frequent one of tar black and equally bitter coffee. I thought of an apology that was best to be shared during these times of uncertainty and guaranteed uncertain and random emotions. I have fallen in love with weightlifting recently. The simultaneous release and surge of emotions you get while doing the simple task of picking things up and putting them down. Imagine if you can relate to so deadlifting a very useful and dangerous exercise, when done correctly, can transform your body into an ancient Greek statue when done consistently enough. Let's say you also enjoy the act of working out, specifically this deadlift motion. You would logically start with a rather light weight, a warm-up. Let's say you're doing your warm-up forever, never-ending. Granted, it's rather light, it is your standard warm-up after all. You can probably do quite a large number of repetitions your warm-up weight. However, you will inevitably get tired. Your form will start to be less than great, and there will be a point where you won't even be able to lift such a benign weight. Truth be told, we are constantly doing our lightest warm-up, every hour of every day, never stopping. Our forms slip, 
and we leave the gym in disappointment. Same goes for our mood. We don't carry the weight of the whole world day in and day out. We carry what we can. And we can do this for a very long time if we know what we're doing. However, I do not care how strong you may be and how great your endurance is. Eventually your form will get shitty. When your form gets shitty, there's only so much that you can deal with. This is a fact of life. You get stronger over time, and with the more facts of life you are forced to deal with, you can lift more without faltering the more you lift. But again, being human means at some point you need to cool off. Ironically, despite loving fitness, I need to leave the gym sometimes. I need a cancer stick and anxiety juice to paradoxically calm down. Of course, you may agree or you may your own recovery set in place in your habits. You need to come to terms with your shitty form. Go deal with life for a bit, correct your form, and get lifting again. The next story is called Empire of Dirt. Lily Burns crouched from behind the car, avoiding the gaze of whatever that thing was. The ten-foot-tall monstrosity scanned the recently made ruins of Manhattan. Lily thought back to before the apocalypse occurred rather rapidly. It wasn't that long ago she was investigating the mysterious meetings of diplomats and shady-looking figures. And although she knew something big was occurring, this wasn't on her mind. The behemoth scanned the area. Its attention snapped into one direction, its weapon raised, strutting over to whatever dared move in its direction. It lowered its odd-looking rifle. It looked around, searching for a victim through the dust. Its head perked up rapidly, almost as if it was listening to an unseen communicator. Lily stared in awe at this thing. It was the first time in the matter of hours that she got a chance to actually study one of them. Large, a mixture of metal, plastic, and exposed flesh, almost human in a warped, dystopian movie sort of way. Its facial features were replaced, it seemed, by sensors and advanced machinery. The most bizarre sensation was that it almost seemed familiar like a long-lost memory of some distant relative. It let out a low grunt and lumbered back down to the street, leaving Lily to live in this horrid new paradigm of human civilization. Lily thought back to a week ago, there very much was a connection, and she would be the one to find out. 11.15 a.m. Wednesday. Lily Burns took a deep breath as she clutched her phone. Today was the day that her journalism degree might actually be worth something, and she could quit that trashy Hooters knockoff. She opened the email from the soapbox, which was a fairly large indie press with an anticipation that rivaled some Midwestern town's high school football team behind a few points in the fourth quarter and sweating at the ten-yard line. She screamed out with joyful tears pooling in her eyelids. 12.13 p.m., Wednesday. Lily walked into Honey Thighs with a huge smile on her face, which was unusual enough when she walked into that place, and her uniform balled up in her hands, tossing the pile of clothes, if you could really call them clothes, onto the floor in front of the manager, followed by a stuck-up middle finger, and the two best words you could say in this scenario. Lily strutted out that fine establishment with a sense of pride, she would never have to don a pair of booty shorts again, unless she wanted to, but that's besides the point. The point was that she didn't have to deal with the typical bullshit a late 20s woman had to deal with while working at a place actually named Honey Thighs. 3.47, Wednesday. Lily poured herself a glass of $4 wine and sat comfortably in her tiny studio apartment. Tomorrow was the day her life began again. 9.33 p.m. Saturday Lily was fairly astonished that not too long ago she was serving chicken wings to horny boomers. And now? Now she was hiding in a car with tinted windows while spying on some unknown CIA-looking suits. 
The taller man handed a folder over to the shorter man. Then they walked in separate directions without saying a word. It was one of the most bizarre things Lily had ever seen. This... This shit doesn't actually happen. This shit is B-movie tier drama. She took her photos. Holy shit, Dave. Holy shit. Dave drove through the city streets. He was in significantly less disbelief than Lily was, as he was following the story before Lily's resume came across the soapbox management. What do you think that was? Said Dave with an almost knowingly tone. I think... I know this, this is some deep government thing. Why is that? Because why couldn't they just send an email? Or even a text message? This is deep enough to where they want to mitigate the threat of some Russian kid hacking into them. Dave smiled. Not bad, kid. Dave was actually a very genuine and sweet man. That Saturday night, Lily began to develop the start of what would have been feelings. Would have been. Would have been if it wasn't for the high-velocity droplet of furrow fluid launched from an alien invader's cannon that made Dave's face a vacant hole. But that was this upcoming Wednesday, and Lily had no idea. All she knew was that she was on to a very big and very interesting story. Oh, how true that would end up being. Now, I guess that was the uh, first part to a series, so it'll be interesting to see where it goes from there. But anyway, the next story is called The Ballad of Mr. Nobody. While you laid in the mud and puffed out your last few breaths, you wonder where it went wrong. Was it genetics that caused you to be such a loser? Was it your parents? Was it their genetics or upbringing? Where did it begin? You know where it ended. Right now, in the middle of a forest, in the center of a puddle that was a mix of blood and shit, you began to weep for a life that wasn't even worth weeping for. You know there was a rapidly approaching point where you wouldn't exist anymore. I knew that was semi-accurate while I watched from behind the nearby stitch point in the veil. I mean, there is never a point where you don't exist anymore. But there is a hell. Multiple, actually. A real funny truth is that there is actually only hells. There is no nice afterlife, you idiot. None of you actually deserve that, and deep down you knew that to a twisted extent. After all, with how everyone in your life has treated you, how could there be any redemption for any of your kind? Like I was saying, I was watching you from the veil, and to be quite honest, I was planning on just eating your soul. But I felt bad, which is quite odd for a demon, as I'm sure you know by now after all this time we spent together. I think it was because I kind of felt that I was a loser too. After all, I didn't even have a cool demon name that sounds all scary and shit. I just kinda... was. I am a loser in demon terms. I think that's why I was attracted to your soul. Your true self. Your absolute being that makes you... you. I saw your almost corpse lying there, waiting for the great reaper while wallowing in misery and pain and sadness and true defeat. I saw you. I saw you, and honestly, I fell in what your kind calls love. It's like your soul and mine, or whatever similar construct you can say is like a soul. We met, and joined, and flourished. You probably don't remember our separate eternity together. You definitely don't remember the million years outside of time we spent together. Joined as one and two, all at the same time. You don't remember, and that's okay, because together we exist in your subjective time and space. A swirl of love and hate and lust and genocide towards each other. You and I, we were made for each other, Wes. I saw you, oh pitiful thing, Dying in the mud because of a misguided love from your monkey brain telling you that Autumn was some vaginal savior to your loneliness and self-hatred. <laughs> I love you, Wes. And my command is why we will eviscerate everyone who wronged you in this town. Wes gazed upon the eternity of the veil. 
He saw pure hatred and pure love, and pure hatred and murder and lust and hatred and companionship and hatred and demonic bonding of everlasting time boiled down to eternity into microseconds that lasted both forever and never. Wes saw this and said, yes. And then, that nameless demon and Wes Shepherd, two losers in their own realms, become the embodiment of that awful and wonderful mixture of hatred that, and something to prove. Two nobodies. They became Mr. Nobody. And Mr. Nobody wanted nothing but blood and sorrow. The two beings coincided in space and time. Two hells combined. They arose, dusted themselves off, straighted out their fine black suit, and walked toward the town. That one was fun. I enjoyed doing a little character voice. Um, I didn't really proofread that uh, beforehand. I didn't. Re I kind of forgot that it was about a demon. Um, so I probably would have done a little bit of a different voice had I known that, but hopefully it worked anyway. Uh, on to the next one. The next story is called The Seven Symphonies of Silence, and it says it is from the Shadow Dies Loudly But No One Hears It Cries story collection. Short story collection, anyway. Forgive me. Dyspraxic brain. Um, here we go. Leonard Stoyov wrote his only play when he was just 21 years old. The Seven Symphonies of Silence has had a unique effect on American theater since its conception in 1923. I'm sure you are all aware of the horrendous aftermath of the only viewing of the infamous production. However, there is more to the tortured man than meets the tortured eye. Daisy continued her speech about Stoyov. The man she admired most was almost as mysterious as his own play, which gained the status of urban legend among the 21st century college theater community. For one, some people think it didn't even exist. It's hard to prove there is a play where everyone who has seen it either died or went into such a deep catatonic state that they might as well be dead. There are multiple theories to why such a thing happened. Everything from the play was just too intense for the people of the past, to the play actually being a secret satanic ritual. If there was anything ever written or said about that strange event, Daisy McIntyre knew about it. The college sophomore was obsessed with Stoyov and his only claim to fame. The strange young woman who changed her hair color once a month gained a reputation on camp for being the life of the party. Little did Daisy know, her peers were more so laughing at her than less with her. To Daisy, she brought a smile to everybody's face, especially Billy Palin, who genuinely did fall for her almost instantly. The one person she did not like was Courtney Burgeon. Because Courtney didn't hide the fact that she couldn't stand Daisy, overly vocal about her disdain towards this manic pixie dream girl. Courtney really just couldn't comprehend how Daisy with her pale as snow skin and enough eyeliner to paint a house black, could be a sexual threat compared to herself, with her blonde hair, eternal summer tan, and hourglass figure. Perhaps the worst part about Daisy was that she would get her way in the group project toward the end of the semester. Courtney would have to endure researching the ridiculous urban legend for a large percent of her grade. Lo and behold, after Daisy's speech, the professor reminded the class of the importance of the group project. Groups were chosen randomly in the beginning of the year by the professor so nobody would feel left out. Courtney was forced to deal with the asinine Daisy and the beta male Billy. The group met in the library after class to discuss the workload. You guys know the theater where Stoyoff showed his play has never been explored? Every ghost type show on TV refuses to film it. We should be the ones to do it. That's retarded. That's a fantastic idea, Daisy. I don't even believe in ghosts, but seriously, that's a really stupid idea. Thanks, Billy. It's really not that far from here, either. What does that have to do with acting or production? You just want to go because it interests you, and Billy only wants to go because he thinks if he agrees with you, you'll finally blow him. I can drive us there. This is going to be such a cool project. Do either of you even hear me? Friday around 7 work? For God's sakes, I should have majored in accounting or something. The trio arrived in Billy's junker car that looked more haunted than the theater. 
The autumn air was colder near the theater. The night was darker. There was an aura of dread that everyone felt, but no one could really describe. Each one knew they didn't belong there. The theater didn't belong here. The entire area was wrong in some way unknown to the modern people. In Courtney's mind laid a very primitive feeling, not unlike when a child is afraid of the dark. In Billy's mind, there was a very loud and very persistent voice begging him to turn around, never come back, and never remember laying eyes on this place. In Daisy's mind was a beckoning, an alluring call that was all at once terrifying, familiar, sensual, and forbidden. She wanted to run into the theater and embrace the soul of the place, much like how a lover embraces her soldier who has returned from a horrible tragedy. Maybe she wanted to fix the place. Maybe she wanted to fix herself. Or maybe she wanted both to remain broken. She wasn't sure, but she knew she was going inside. Nope, said Courtney. Once again, her protest fell on ears guilty of selective hearing. I am not going in there. I, I'm just not. She was on the verge of tears. She couldn't remember a time she was more afraid. Courtney pulled out her phone and ordered an Uber. She walked away, leaving the duo to their fate. Billy and Daisy stood outside, unaware that Courtney's ride had picked her up five minutes ago, frozen, almost as if they were waiting for the show to start. They would enter when they were allowed to enter. Their sense of time was lost. Perhaps they were standing outside in awe for only a few minutes. Perhaps the tragedy of the area warped the fabric of time. No one would ever know. Daisy broke the spell first and entered the building, with Billy catching up the rear. The theater was beautiful. The real tragedy was that this building closed after one performance. Despite being built in the 1920s, there was the sense that this could have been built at any time. What we would call modern art covered the walls. To the average citizen nearly 100 years ago, it must have been incomprehensible. It's beautiful spoke Daisy. Billy could only nod in agreement. A deep part of his being refused to let him sneak inside this place. Daisy proceeded to take pictures and notes while Billy followed her around in silence. Daisy had been aware that Billy was infatuated with her for some time now. Granted, she liked the attention, the free drinks, the free coffees. There were a few free meals, too. The best part was that she didn't even have to sleep with him, and without a complaint he would bow down. She did think he was attractive. It was just that she could not commit to anything serious at the moment. Daisy was currently writing four different plays in addition to a few acting auditions here and there, as well as her part-time job at the school's art gallery, the metric ton of schoolwork she had to do, and her four dogs that she dedicated every dollar she had to. Her hands were tied. There was no way she could put in the work of a relationship. However, that didn't mean she couldn't enjoy the benefits of one. However, in this moment, Billy was killing her vibe. This place, this area, this slice of time and space that felt as if it was separate from the rest of reality, separate from every worry and every pain and every heartache, insult, screaming match with dad, bad grade, and odd looks she ever had received. This was a place she belonged. This was... The place. The place she had never been to, but has been homesick for since before she was conceived. It may have needed her more than she needed it. Hey, Billy, why don't you go check out some of the other rooms? Take notes and stuff. Uh, are you sure you want to be here alone? Why wouldn't I? Uh, okay. Billy walked away from an enthralled Daisy. A terrifying thought entered Billy's mind. What if this place is a den of crackheads or a satanic cult, and they murder him and do even worse to Daisy? What if he never sees her again? Daisy laughed out loud for some unknown amount of time after Billy left. She thought to herself, why would there be crackheads or devil worshippers in this place? This place was art made physical. It's simple logic. Billy is madly in love with me, but thinks if he tries too hard, but also not hard enough, he'll lose his chances. In actuality, maybe I really want him to man up and ask me out like a man should. But at the same time, I want him to figure that out on his own. 
I mean, I would probably say no due to everything going on in my life. Then again, he should still take charge. After all, the sheer audacity to ask someone out the old-fashioned way is so rare these days. I give him the chance just because. That's why I try so hard to stand out, after all. I didn't get the attention necessary to develop social aptitude. And now I seek it in every way possible. <laughs> Dad was right. I am messed up in the head. If I was someone like Courtney, I'd be faking it, but maybe I'd be happier. Maybe that's just life. Faking it until you're alone in your room crying into your third bottle of wine on a Friday night because you don't have any friends. Maybe that's... How did I know Billy thought that thing about crackheads in a satanic cult? As Billy walked aimlessly, he could have sworn he'd seen the same abstract pattern on that wall for the fifth time. The nonsensical geometric shapes never repeated before. Perhaps the artist in charge of this odd decor simply got bored or uninspired. Perhaps he was lost. Perhaps it was the same pattern that Billy was seeing because this place didn't want him to leave, and it would most certainly get its way. What? exclaimed Billy. Billy swore he heard a voice. Who's there? Who's saying that? The weak-willed man wandered endlessly, more confused than he was before. The hell, man? Who's saying this? I have a gun, douchebag! Not only did Billy not actually have a gun, not only was he a small and sad little boy who was terrified of firearms, or any weapon for that matter, but he was foolish enough to think that a man-made creation could save him. Now Billy began to feel true fear. No one really feels true fear anymore. They feel a little bit of fright from other humans and toys that humans made. They don't remember what used to lurk in the corners at night. They don't remember why they still are afraid of the dark. They don't remember that primal feeling in a very specific circumstance that a quick death would be heavenly dream rather than a falsehood. Today, men like Billy exist. Today, men have forgotten their purpose. And they certainly seem to have forgotten why their dead god made them more aggressive than their better halves that they are so proud of. Truth is, Billy, you are a failure of your kind. But I appreciate it. That just makes it easier to do what I do. Have you ever seen a dragon? Why would every culture design a creature that looks so similar, despite those cultures never having contact? It's because a dragon is more than a great monster. It's because dragons are very real. They just look a little different than how your kind pictures them today in this time. A dragon is something you need to defeat. But how can you? How can you, of all people, save the damsel in distress before the dragon swallows you both? And you sit and wallow in misery for eons until the world goes dark and cold, only to come into existence again, like it always has, just to be born again and suffer the same fate again and again and again and again forever, Billy. It's because you will never improve. That is who you are, never accomplishing what you think is your goal, only succeeding in my goal, my goal that I have set for you many lifetimes ago. You are mine, Billy. Billy was on the floor sobbing and soaked in piss. He never really paid any attention to the random mannequin he would see while walking through his labyrinth. But they noticed him. Billy looked up and saw that he was surrounded by the faceless wooded beings. They started to hum. They hummed a beautiful song, a song that brought in every emotion Billy had ever felt, all at once coming in through every neuron within him. He felt pain and bliss, rage and compassion, despair and joy all at the same time. Billy rose to his feet. He saw that the room he was in was completely filled with these mannequins, shoulder to shoulder, completely still and singing in silence. Knowledge flooded Billy's mind, knowledge that was best forgotten, but was brought into existence when Leonard Stoyov glimpsed into the crowded void by mere accident. Or was it fate? And wrote these seven symphonies of silence. Being the starving artist he was, he assumed this knowledge was a muse, a brief spark of random genius, 
Little did he know that they were instructions for a purpose he nor any of your kind would understand, yet they would all play a part in it. This song that Billy was hearing was the first symphony of silence, and yes, it is pathetic he couldn't even get to finish the final seventh, let alone the second. In fairness, no one else did. Stoyov himself stopped listening to the orchestra after the fourth. He killed himself on stage halfway through the fifth. One man in the audience nearly a hundred years ago had such a strong will that he lasted a few minutes into the sixth before losing the ability to think. He was the only audience member who wasn't dead during the final seventh, but he was brain dead and would live the rest of his days in a brain dead state once the play ended. The orchestra dropped one by one, the stronger ones being broken beyond repair and the weaker ones leaving this world. This was unknown to everyone, but despite being dead or close to it, they still played their instruments, and they would continue to do so forever. The actors and dancers finished the play and dropped dead when it was done. They lived through the final seventh, but it's very hard to ask dead men and women about it. Not impossible, but you wouldn't want to discuss anything with their spirits. It would be very detrimental to your well-being. Alas, Billy was consumed by the first. He truly was a pathetic and weak creature. Before he entered oblivion, he knew something he shouldn't have. There was an usher who fled the theater halfway through the second. His name was Jonathan McIntyre. He would retain his sanity, but his essence was forever tainted, destined to be consumed by this blight upon this world. His cancer consumed him in his old age, but his great-granddaughter would be consumed by this theater. Daisy McIntyre heard the humming mannequins. The place allowed her to walk through it without issue. There would be no trouble given to royalty. He appeared before them. They turned toward her. They parted to reveal a broken Billy at the center. Daisy ran toward him. She understood halfway through the first symphony. Then the mannequins began to sing the second, then the third, then the fourth, then the fifth, then the sixth, and once they began the final seventh, Daisy reached a pinnacle, a dreadful enlightenment where she knew and saw all. She knew her life and every deviation it could have taken. She was doomed from the start. Even if Courtney got her way and they did literally anything else, even if her great-grandfather took that night off from being an usher, even if Stoyov never wrote this cursed thing, Daisy would have ended up the same alone and miserable. This was due to forces beyond her control. She was destined to be born in the area she was in, but she wasn't always destined to be where she was now. She was because her ancestors made poor choices, and they cursed her far beyond her time. Their bloodlines were tainted because of those choices, and now she had to suffer. She had a choice. The final seventh would never end because it was the insanity of life. She was the only one who could retain her consciousness. Therefore, she was given the choice of rescuing Billy's broken mind, having children, avoiding the cycle of leaving this place only to enter the dark after her break from reality and resulting suicide. Every bad decision, every sin, every falter from the path, they all put her in this loop. And Stoyov knew this. This is what he saw. She had partial control, and she made her decision. Daisy sat in the handcrafted leather seat. Her lover, William, sat next to her. There were tears in his eyes, but he could not protest. He was with her, and that meant he was happy, even if he wasn't. The gentleman known as Leonard Stoyov walked onto the stage. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the Seven Symphonies of Silence. The room applauded, like they always have, for what could be considered forever in human terms. The musical play began. Daisy loved it more each time it played. For a brief time, she remembered that separate time when she chose to stay here with her lover. She would watch all seven of the symphonies with the marionette-like actors dancing and singing to her amusement. 
with the orchestra never ending their trance of music and sadness, with her lover, who would never leave her and do whatever she said, whenever she said it. The play began. A hush fell over the infinite room of everyone who has ever seen or heard or felt this curse. Daisy whispered to a silent William, whose petticoat was stained with his constant tears. I love you. I love you, too, he said between his silent sobbing. After all, he got what he wanted. The memory of dying entered his head, like it always did at this time in this haunted area, separate from reality. He remembers screaming as he was torn apart by invisible forces. He remembered the smile of Daisy's face as the blood and gore painted the theater. He remembers dying loudly. He remembers no one hearing his cries. But he was happy with her. So he was happy. Wow, so honestly, that was the first time I ever read that story, and I got into it. That was a suspenseful story. It was, like, psychologically thrilling. I mean, <laughs> it's so funny that I would be, like, reacting to it while also kind of reading it and getting into the character of it all at the same time. It's interesting. I really enjoyed that story. Um, that was definitely my favorite of the ones that I've read so far. So, fantastic job. That was a very interesting story, and I loved how it ended. While you laugh in the face of God, Belle awoke from a nightmare, one where her innocence and humanity was lost all once by thick black tentacles and a cold gray cloud, suffocating and invading her. Finally, the coils entered her spinal cord, and that is when she woke up. While she sat in bed, breathing heavily, she noticed a wetness on her nightgown. She didn't know if she was that scared during the night, or, or perhaps she really was invaded by the inhuman things. The church bells rang. It was time for mass. Belle woke her older sister Jillian by throwing a balled-up sock at her head. Jill made a noise that sounded almost a bit like, Screw church! But Belle knew that Jill would never slander the Lord like that. Belle got dressed in a hurry, while Jill was already dressed when she took off the covers. "'Why are you wearing your clothes to bed?' asked Belle. "'Uh, I came home late. "'Jillian, were you with that Jack boy again? "'Maybe if you were a real woman, you'd know what it's like to be with a man.' Belle studied Jill like she did every day child-bearing hips and large breasts, the treasure that all men in the village wanted, whereas Belle was short and childlike, despite being almost twenty. She didn't hate her sister, but there was a strong envy toward her. Belle knew that the church said not to be envious, and she wondered how they knew what it was like to be the woman who was never looked at, to be the woman that no man wanted. Deep down, Belle was angry that the great shepherd did not bless her with good looks. If she did have kids, they would be weak like her. Her sons would never be hunters or builders. Her daughters would not be attractive enough to get a man with natural success. And when she was old and gray, she would die alone, unable to be helped by her children. The village might even send her to the woods to die. It was either death or be damned eternally if the witches got to her. If I am truly blessed, Belle thought, then I will die in my sleep while my god laughs at me. The two sisters went to the temple in the center of town. Jill went to sit next to Jack, the strong son of a woodsman who had been very kind to Jill ever since she developed. Belle, looking for a place to sit, sat next to a blind old man who didn't seem to notice her. The sermon began. It is the fourteenth day of the harvest season, and our Lord has blessed us with wondrous crops this year, said the high priest as the crowd began to cheer. The great shepherd has blessed us with food, clean water, and air, and beautiful child-bearing women. We will return the favor, but first, today's lesson. The crowd grew silent. Everyone in the room was ecstatic to hear what knowledge the high priest had for them. 
In the Dark Age, men and women held power beyond even our Lord's understanding. They were demonic, evil creatures. The false Adam and Eves were given seats at the grand feasts, and even man and demon joined in an unholy matrimony. The false ones and their enlightened slaves ruled the outskirts of our peaceful and God-fearing village. I look around the room and can recognize all of you. We have been a strong community, blessed and pure. We will be the ones in the kingdom of heaven, because we were blessed with death, forgetfulness, and the brain fog. Does anyone here know why we live in this sanctuary? It is because our ancestors knew what was right. No one here knows why they were right, but we accept it as truth, because that is the way of the great shepherd. Men are not supposed to know everything. From the first men to the last, we will be humble in our death. The crowd erupted with applause. The blind old man wasn't clapping, and he leaned into Bell's ear and whispered, One day we will both laugh in the face of God. Then he got up and walked out of the temple. Later on, Bell wondered what that old man meant. Did he know she was angry at the Creator? Was he a witch? Or worse, was he a false one, infiltrating the village? No, that's silly. The false ones probably don't even exist, Bell thought. She continued to sew a hole in the dress and not think about such nonsense. Jill had been missing for several hours now. Bell was told by her uncle when Jill didn't come back from the well. She's probably off with Jack. What do you mean, off with Jack? Bell froze up. She didn't mean to give away her sister's secret like that. She stammered and stuttered and tried to fabricate a lie to cover up what she meant, but her uncle wasn't listening. He was already taking the pitchfork off the shelf, ready to hunt down this Jack and protect his niece's soul. What started out as a manhunt by one angry uncle turned into a community-led search for bodies in a matter of hours. Nobody could find a trace of Jack or Jill. The high priest led a sermon an hour after the search ended. Bell wasn't paying attention. Her mind was occupied by the fact that her sister might be dead. There were talks of false ones in the forest, or witches looking for a sacrifice. The blind old man was in the corner of the room. Even though his eyes were milky white and dead, Bell could feel his gaze upon her. As Bell slept that night, she dreamed of the black tentacles and gray clouds surrounding Jill and violating her. Eventually, the tentacles slithered away, and the cloud disappeared. What was left was a gray being that somewhat resembled Jill, but hairless and covered in strange markings. The gray being opened its mouth, and a blue light shone. Bell was drawn to it. It called out messages of peace and unity, of knowledge from beyond the stars and deep within the human mind. Temptation was too much and Belle embraced the gray being. Then she woke up. Belle made the decision to skip church and sneak off to the woods. She crept by her uncle, who was making his way towards her cabin, and entered his tool shed. She grabbed a hammer and broke into a sprint into the woods. She didn't know where she was going, but she thought that the great shepherd would guide her. Belle was barely 100 pounds. She knew she couldn't do much damage with a hammer, but it was the first thing she grabbed and she couldn't head back now. Everyone in the village would be in the temple. Nobody would know that she was gone until hours passed. Besides, she could always blame witches that controlled her mind or a false one chased her into the woods. The elders of the village believed such nonsense. Belle was too smart to fall for superstition. Though the deeper into the woods she traveled, the more frightened she got. There cannot be any witches or false ones. But what about bandits or murderers, or worse, lurking in these woods? Belle thought to herself. She knew many people were exiled over the years to this forest. What if they were still here? A twig snapped, and Belle dropped her hammer. A cackle rippled through the woods, and Belle took off running. Her sense of direction was lost. All that mattered was to move away from whatever laughed at her. She saw a clearing in the trees, a small patch of grass where she could hide. Suddenly the grass burst into flames. She turned around to see an old woman draped in rags standing in the distance. Belle turned. Another exact replica stood in her path. Every direction held an identical old woman, rapidly approaching her. Belle screamed, and as hands covered her face, and her world turned to blackness. Belle awoke to the smell of boiling roots. 
She opened her eyes and watched the old woman dice mushrooms with the large black knife and gently drop them into a boiling pot. You're up, little one. Belle was petrified. The old woman walked slowly toward her, flashing a smile of yellow and jagged teeth. What are you going to do to me? What did you do to my sister? I know where your sister is. The air tells me where she is in the false world, as you people call it. She is enlightened now. The church says enlightenment is a terrible thing. The church, <laughs> the old woman cackled. The church knows nothing, and they are proud of it. I, I see all. How do you see all? Our ancestors left us gifts everywhere. You just need to know how to tap into them. Each one smaller than a speck of dust, but as powerful as a rifle. More so. I communicate with these gifts. I was too poor to become a false one. I could never have the luxury. But I studied the world around me and became one with the universe. I don't understand anything you're talking about. You will learn, little Belle. One day you will laugh in the face of God. How... How do you know my name? The old woman cackled again, but this one turned into a rough cough. <laughs> I told you, dearie. I know everything. Head to the mountain. All your questions will be answered there. But first, you are weak. Drink this, and you will be strong. The old woman handed her a bowl of steaming blue liquid. Belle sniffed it. It had no smell. She drank it with hesitation, knowing it was the only way out of this old woman's hovel. All finished? The old woman said with a smile. Belle couldn't answer, for everything went dark, and she could no longer see the old woman. Belle stood up in the darkness, and the floor formed where she walked. She was afraid she would misstep and plunge into infinite darkness. A door appeared. She opened it and entered a field of blue grass and glass trees. She wandered the landscape. When off in the distance, she saw two children, both wearing masks, off in the distance. She ran over to them. She kept running, never getting closer. The children kept their distance no matter how fast or far she ran. Eventually, she stopped gasping for breath. The children approached her. It only took them a few steps. She looked at them. She couldn't tell their gender. One was wearing a mask that looked sad. The other wore one that looked happy. Who are you two? We, we are, are strife in paradise. paradise. One, one does, does not exist, exist without, without the other, other, they said in unison. What, what are you? We, we are, are the, the new gods built eons ago and put in charge of you mortals. Your old gods died, never existed, or abandoned you. We cannot come to a solid conclusion. Where is my sister? Safe, for now. How do I get to her? You don't. I don't understand. Where am I? You are in the place of the enlightened. Your kind calls us the false ones. Your kind builds then tries to destroy. You are a paradox of nature. How do I leave? Not many of your kind want to leave, but we suppose it makes sense. After all, you are but a child, new to this universe and your own. You know nothing. At the moment, you are nothing, until you can prove yourself. How do I prove myself? Embrace us, then you will know. Bell walked up to them cautiously, and suddenly strife and paradise expanded outward, black tentacles and gray clouds emitting from their bodies. Bell was terrified. She couldn't move as the cloud entered her nose and throat, and the tentacles burrowed into her flesh. She did not feel pain or discomfort, just fear. Fear of the unknown. She could faintly hear the words, She's waking up! Plug her back in! It sounded too clear to be a coincidence. Suddenly she was back in the dark world. Nothingness. She tried to look at her own hands, but couldn't find them. There was just nothing. Hello, she called out, and then big white letters appeared in front of her and spelled out, Hello. Is anybody out there? Is anybody out there? 
What is happening? What is happening? Great Shepherd, please help me. Suddenly a field appeared out of nowhere, this one different from the previous one. It was bright green grass, dark gray clouds covered the sky, and a young man wearing a cloak and carrying a cane stood next to Bell. You called me? Are you? Yes, I am the Great Shepherd. You know you have done some naughty things, Bell. I know. I shouldn't have been jealous of Jill. I shouldn't have skipped church and wandered off. I'm sorry. I am so sorry. Please just give me my sister back and bring me home. I want to bring you home, but I don't think I can. It's not up to me. You're a god! We worship you! How can you not do anything to help me? I am a construct of your mind, Bill. I exist only because you exist. I don't understand any of you. What is going on? All we be forgiven one day. Soon you will laugh in the face of God. Just then everything disappeared again, and Bell awoke in her bed. She got up and walked over to her sister's bed. It was empty. She knew what needed to be done, but she had to make sure. Bell journeyed to the well where Jack and Jill were last sent. She peered inside. There were their bodies. Their skulls caved in from several hammer blows. Bell went down to the temple and told the community what she did. There was a trial. Some claim that Bell was driven mad by her sister and killed her and her lover out of jealousy. Some claim that Bell went mad when some pervert killed Jack and Jill, her being the only witness, and thinking she killed them. That a girl that small and weak could never do that much damage. At the end of the day, Bell was found guilty and sentenced to burn at the stake. Bell stood on the pile of twigs and branches. The high priest held the torch and said a quick sermon. Bell wasn't listening. She just couldn't wait to die. The high priest dropped the torch and set the pile ablaze. Bell's dress caught fire, the fabric melting to her skin. It was excruciating pain, and some villagers turned away to block out her screams. Eventually, Bell's nerve endings fried, and she couldn't even feel the pain anymore. And then she died. Then she awoke. The glass tube opened, and the face mask came off. She fell to the floor and gasped for breath. Two orderlies rushed into the room, nightsticks ready. Attempt 647 has been a failure, albeit with partial success. She was finally admitted some guilt, said one of the orderlies. Bell's head spun and she vomited out of fear and confusion. Bell, I'm sure you like an explanation. However, I've given you the same story so many times. I don't know if you will ever fully be rehabilitated. Bell just stared at him. The memories flooded back. Bell growing up ugly and in the shadow of her sister. Bell's resentment and hatred for Jill growing stronger each year. Bell habitually escaping reality with alcohol. Bell murdering her own sister. I preferred it when we could just kill criminals. It was more humane than this hippie bullshit. Come on, let's plug her back in. The two men lifted the husk of a woman back into the pod and ran the simulation over again. Bell didn't say a word. She knew this is where she belonged. Her memories started to disappear. She tried to scream, but no sound came out. She awoke from a nightmare. And so concludes my first podcast for 2021. Uh, hopefully my readings weren't too bad. Um, as a dyspraxic, I'm not always the best at cold readings. Um, as an experienced actor. I don't, you know, I'm not professional, but I've had a lot of experience with acting. I'm definitely a lot better when I've practiced the material, but hopefully I did a good enough job with the, uh, with doing it cold. Um, next time I will probably, uh, practice the, the stuff that I'm reading a little bit more. I'm so, I don't know what it is with me today. I just, I cannot seem to think straight or talk straight. And that's one reason why I haven't been doing this podcast in a while, because, it's just been really hard for me to, to ta keep a train of thought so that I can actually speak eloquently enough uh, for a podcast. I mean, people who do podcasts, you would think that they should be well-spoken, but I certainly am not that, at least not these days. 
Uh, try not to create dead air. But uh, hopefully you've enjoyed listening to this nonetheless. And if you enjoyed hearing me read these stories out loud, um, I really enjoy doing doing stuff like this. So if you are a writer yourself, then please feel free to send me your short stories uh, in no matter, no matter whatever way you'd like to reach me through Facebook. Uh, you can find me on The Theatric Dyspraxic. Also, if you want to... Uh, to check out some more uh, content from T.L. Oberhue. Uh, I'm just going to pronounce it that way. I apologize if I'm pronouncing it wrong. But you can uh, check out some more of his uh, work and the stuff that he's published with his publishing uh, company or whatever you want to call it, uh, boxheadbooks.com. And you could also uh, check out his vocal media account, which that will be in the description. So... Hopefully you have enjoyed that. It's also hard for me to do this podcast because I'm I record it from my parents' house and it's just a little bit awkward to do it because uh, you know you don't have that much privacy. So I kind of have to keep it a little bit uh, on the DL, maybe a little bit. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I wish for the best for everybody during 2021. Um, you know, I had a lot of hope. In the beginning of 2020 and it kind of turned into a crappy year so um it's always hard at the beginning of a year to maintain that kind of hope like oh this is gonna be my year but uh i just hope that 2021 isn't another 2020 i don't think it will be um i think we're gonna start getting on the right track i don't know if we're gonna make a lot of progress during this year i hope so but i think we'll at least get the ball rolling um so let's just hope that this is a good year for everybody and I expect to hear more from me soon and I promise I will get better at this uh, and have a happy new year and I will see you next week. Ta-ta.